Hello everybody, my name is Forrest and welcome back to Five Nights in Biology class. Today, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite species on the planet. Do you know that sheep are more closely related to dolphins than they are to humans? This is because the artiodactyls, the even-toed ungulates, share a more recent common ancestor with cetaceans, dolphins, whales, and porpoises, than they do with primates. In fact, they're even in the same taxonomic order called Set Artiodactyla, because it contains both the cetaceans and the artiodactyls. And by the way, having an even number of toes is what sets the artiodactyls apart from the perizodactyls, which have an odd number of toes, and the perizodactyls split from the artiodactyls way before the cetaceans did, which means this little lamb is more closely related to a blue whale than a horse. How awesome is that? This is Oliver, by the way. He's mowing my lawn. Yeah, he loves dandelion. Look at him go. Spring has sprung, and that means you're probably going to be seeing a lot more animals out and about. So this is your yearly biologist reminder to leave them alone. Just, just don't mess with the animals. If you see cute, adorable baby animals that look lost and helpless and on their own, you, ju you just leave them alone. Sometimes turtles cross roads. And if you need to help them, that's fine. If it is safe for you to get to them and you can safely move them, then do so. Just put them on the other side of the road in the direction that they were going and then walk away. Don't take them home. Think about them like old ladies. If you saw an old lady crossing the road, would you just help her get to the other side of the road or would you snatch her up and cram her in a shoebox? Just help them, but don't mess with them. Sometimes you're going to see a cute little adorable baby animal all on its own out there in the wild. And you're going to think that you need to snatch it up and you need to take it home and you need to raise it and take good care of it. Don't. Just don't do it. Because nine times out of ten, the mother is nearby and just went away for a minute. And even if the baby kind of meandered off and got lost, they've been doing it for billions of years. It's going to be all right. And yes, every now and then, there is a time when a small animal actually does need human intervention. And if you really, really think that you're in that situation, you can call your local Department of Wildlife Conservation or whatever the equivalent of that is outside of the U.S., and they will almost certainly give you resources or instructions that you can follow. But beyond that, just leave nature in nature. Because when people don't do that, it's a tale as old as time, you find yourself in a situation where you're out exploring some abandoned house, and you find a big old nest of barn owls, and the mother isn't anywhere to be found, and so you assume that all of these baby owls have been abandoned, and so you scoop them all up, and shove them in a tub, and drop them off at your local vet's office, and the veterinarian doesn't know when, or where, or if, or how he can possibly relocate these owls, and so he calls his biologist friend, and then he ends up having to babysit a bucket of owls. It's the smell that hits you, you know? Yeah. These situations can easily be avoided. Leave animals alone. It's a beaded lizard. Get it? This is a great question. Because once again, access to abortion is being challenged. And people are going to be asking questions like this a lot in order to try to gain some insight in this whole debate. And the truth of the matter is, as someone who's been studying life for a very long time, I can make a really good argument both for and against life starting at fertilization, at implantation, at a heartbeat, at some level of brain activity, at birth. Or even that it never really starts at all because life already started almost 4 billion years ago and it's been an unbroken chain ever since and sperm and eggs are both alive and the zygote they produce alive and blah, blah, blah. But really, not one single bit of it matters. None of it makes any difference in this debate because when we're talking about abortion, we are talking about exactly one issue, just one, and that is human rights. What rights do you have to decide what happens to your body? And more importantly, who gets to use your body for nourishment against your will? So you can say that life starts as early as you'd like. Say that the moment a baby is even thought about, it is now a fully-fledged human being with all the same rights as me. Give it a P.O. box and a social security number. It doesn't change a thing. 
My mom is my biological mother. I came out of her, and she has the same blood type as me. If I need a blood transfusion, I could use her blood to sustain my life. But if I go over with a needle and a hose and forcibly stab it into her arm and start to use her body to nourish mine, she has every right to remove that needle from her arm and say, I don't want to participate in this, even if that decision kills me, because that's her body and she has rights over it. So to say that she could not stop sustaining my life while I was still a fetus isn't to give a fetus the same rights as me, it's to give a fetus extra special bonus rights that I don't have. And another thing you have to consider is the fact that if I want to be an organ donor, I have to sign up for that while I'm still alive. If I die and you need my heart to live and I didn't sign up before I died, we're both dying now. So if you're going to say that somebody with a uterus can't choose who gets to use their uterus to live, then you are saying that a pregnant person has less rights than a literal corpse. So rather than try to keep up with the mental gymnastics of saying that you can lose rights by being born and then gain back other rights by dying, I just maintain the position that every single person should get to decide what happens to their own body. Because those are the rights that I've enjoyed every day of my life without any question. Different organs doesn't mean different rights. Anytime that I release a video, either here or on the better platform, that has anything at all to do with politics, even if it actually isn't a political video, it just uses some political sounding language, or if it touches on a topic that's sort of tangentially related to something in politics at the moment, I inevitably get a bunch of people in the comment section telling me that they don't want me to talk about politics, that this is a science channel, they didn't follow me for politics, they don't want to hear about my politics, and that I should just stick to teaching science. And this is something that I've talked about a few times before, but there's one angle to it that I have never talked about that I think is really important. And it involves a word that is sometimes misused, but is way more often misunderstood. And that word is privilege. When people get upset because politics are being mingled into their entertainment, they are demonstrating a massive amount of privilege. Because as I've said before, everything in life is political. Every single aspect of every single day, everything you do has politics involved in it. And if you get to ignore that fact, you are incredibly fortunate. Because there are whole groups of people out there whose entire lives are politically contentious. Their health, their safety, their acceptance in society, their basic human rights, even their right to exist in this world, being something that is up for debate at this very moment. And while, of course, intersectionality is a thing, so there's going to be varying degrees of severity to this, and you might think that that muddies the water a little bit, it's not exactly difficult to just look at the opposite end of the spectrum. Take me, for example. I don't ever have to talk about politics. I could have a long and fruitful career. I could get more followers than Charlie D'Amelio could ever dream of. I could be the next Bill Nye and wear a fancy hat, and I would never have to breathe a word about trans rights or about health care or about guns or about anything. I would be just fine without politics. And that's because my basic human rights and dignities aren't on the chopping block right now. Nobody's arguing about what bathrooms I should be allowed to use, or what medical procedures I should have access to, or if I should be evicted from my home over my sexuality, or if the police are justified in strangling me to death, or who I should be allowed to marry. Like, my life hasn't been easy by any stretch of the imagination, but it certainly wasn't made any harder by who I am, you know? So I have the privilege of ignoring a lot of problems if I choose to. I choose not to, because I think that's a crappy thing to do, but there are lots and lots of people out there that embrace and enjoy that privilege, oftentimes that I've been thinking about it. And they get really mad when things get political when they didn't want them to. And what I wish I could get across to those people is that it's not that things are just all about gender and race and stuff all of a the sudden. They have always been about those things. And while I'm sure it's very frustrating for you to have to hear about these problems, it is worse for the people who have to live with them. So pay attention. I thought this was a snake. Look at the size of this worm! Oh my glob! I love him. Go, worm. Be free. Fight the capitalist machine. You have nothing to lose but your chains.